Well, good morning, Bethesda. Good morning, church. Uh, you know, as it has been often said that the church is not a building, and that the church is a body, and that is true because though we might be in various places this morning, whether it be your home, your living room, your dorm room, your office, or some other place, we are together, worshiping together, we just prayed together, and together we're going to hear from the Word of God. And as Pastor Bruce mentioned a moment ago, we're starting a brand new sermon series called Paradox. And uh, if you're not familiar with that word or just can't really recall what it means, allow me to define it for you. A paradox is defined as a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. Of course, the Bible is filled with uh, these paradoxical statements. And when you read these verses out of context, you know, they may seem strange, they may seem odd, but when, it, when read in context, they make a whole lot of sense. For example, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 25, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And, you know, on the surface, that doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but when you sort of step back and you read the verse in its context, you really understand what it means. Jesus was saying that life, true life, eternal life is found in him. And if serving, even if serving Jesus costs you your life, you don't lose it, but you gain everlasting life, uh, which is far greater because of your faith and trust in him. And there are many others that we will be highlighting in the next few weeks as we journey through this series together. And I don't really want to give them all away today, but I do uh, want to highlight one. And we believe that these messages would be just a source of encouragement uh, for you and for us all as we embark upon a brand new year together. And you know, as we do, uh, as we go into 2022, we may be tempted, you know, to step uh, into this brand new season uh, into this brand new year, living out the same faith uh, and uh, living out the same fear or reality that we just stepped out of. But you know what? We need to be reminded that, you know what? God is with us and that God is for us and that God is speaking his truth over our lives that, you know, oftentimes seems oxymoronic and illogical on the surface. Uh, but as we trust in him and as we follow him and as we walk with him and as we believe in him, he will be faithful to do something in and through our lives uh, that is beyond what we could ever dream. Uh, like the songwriter says, little is much when God is in it. It doesn't, uh, as we said in a previous sermon series, it doesn't make sense, yet it makes perfect sense. Let that be the case in our lives and in our church in this new year, that God would do something amazing uh, and beyond what we could ever ask or imagine according to uh, his power that works within us. If you have the Word of God with you, and it's going to be on the screen as well, we're going to take a look at a passage of Scripture uh, from Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, starting at verse 30, and we're going to read down to verse 37. It says, And from there they went out and began to go through Galilee. And he did not want anyone to know about it, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is going to be handed over to men, and they will kill him, and when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. But they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, they began to, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. And sitting down, he called the twelve and he said to them this paradoxical statement. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and placed him among them. And taking him in his arms, he, re he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. May God bless the reading of his word this morning into our hearing. In the text, we see that Jesus and his disciples were going throughout Galilee. Nothing, nothing strange or abnormal about that. That was pretty, pretty normal. Uh, Galilee was in the northern part of Israel, and it was the place where Jesus did most of his ministry. But this time, and at this moment, 
He did not want anyone to know about it. And the reason why was that he was preparing his disciples and most likely himself as well for what was coming down the road, which was the cross. The purpose for why he came into this world. And he reveals to his disciples, he says, you know, that they, he will be betrayed and killed but will be raised back to life three days later. They didn't really understand what he was talking about and Mark records that they were afraid to ask him. Speaking about this text, D.E. Garland says, when he makes his second prediction of his death and resurrection, the disciples keep silent. They do not comprehend what he is talking about, but they are afraid to ask him what it means. Either they are wary of being rebuked if, if they say anything, as Peter was earlier, or they prefer to live in a state of denial. They may not uh, have wanted to understand the unpleasant reality staring Jesus in the face. You see, this was the second of three predictions that Jesus makes concerning his death. The first was back in chapter 8, 31, 32, around there, right right after the moment when Peter correctly proclaims uh, and declares who Jesus was and says, you are the Christ. Jesus tells them immediately after that he was going to suffer and be rejected by the religious leaders, but once again he would rise again. And later in Mark 10, next chapter over, verse 33, 34, Jesus, like I said, again, he reveals what will happen to him. He said, we're going to go to Jerusalem, and, and the religious leaders and the, and the chief priests and the scribes, they're going, to, they're going to condemn me to death. I'm going to be handed over to be killed. I'm going to be mocked and spat upon and scourged and, and killed. But he again, once he reminds them of the fact that three days later, he is going to rise again. And so... From Mark 8 onwards, Jesus is taking his disciples on a journey, a journey that will end in Jerusalem, a journey that will end in death, a journey that will end with him being crucified on the cross, but also a journey that will include a resurrection from the dead and an ascension back to heaven. And even though he revealed this on multiple occasions, the disciples were just not getting it. And despite all that he reveals, we see here that he questions them as to what they were talking about on their way from Galilee to Capernaum, on on that pathway, on that road. He knew what they were talking about. But he asked them them the question because he wanted them to know and to realize that he knew. Reminds me of when we ask our children of what they were up to. Uh, We know that they were maybe have done something or said something that they shouldn't have. But, but we want them to be honest with us and for them to tell us so that we can have a conversation about it so we can discuss what happened together. It's a teaching moment. And by asking them this question, Jesus was setting them up for a teaching moment. You see, they were having this private conversation. They sort of set up a, a private group chat and they were debating who was the, the greatest disciple of Jesus. They were debating who ranked at the top, who was first, second, third, and all the way down to 12. They were just wondering who was at the top. And when Jesus questioned them on it, they remained silent because they were too embarrassed to admit the topic of their self-centered conversation. D.E. Garland again says, in this present passage, the disciples are jockeying for position to be honored alongside their powerful liberator Messiah. The, the picture Mark presents has tragic comic dimensions. Jesus walks ahead in silence on his way to a sacrificial death, while his staggering disciples push and shove, trying to establish the order of the procession behind him. He goes on to say the disciples still have visions of grandeur and do not fantasize about becoming servants who are at everybody's beck and call. They suffer from puffed up ambition that will never be, that will never be ready to take up a cross and follow a suffering servant Messiah. This discussion about greatness and who were more important than who was no doubt the result of what happened earlier, uh, I believe in in Mark chapter 8. As mentioned a few moments ago, Peter was uh, the first one to correctly discern Jesus' divine identity. And shortly after, he along with James and John were selected to see Jesus transfigured on the mountainside. 
They had got to see the glory of God in Christ as his clothes became whiter than uh, a whiter white than he had ever saw before. And, and Elijah and Moses shows up, something that don't happen every day, and they were talking to him. This is an amazing once-in-a-lifetime event. Peter was also rebuked and corrected by Jesus for his response to both events. Because what the Messiah meant for him as well as the other disciples was well, not what Jesus came to do. It was not what he had in mind. Peter really wanted Jesus to become king right then and there and to rule and reign over his people, have an earthly kingdom and conquer their enemies and, and you know, have freedom. But what he had in mind was not the will and plan of God and, what, and he wanted Jesus to have glory without the cross, something that Satan tried to tempt Jesus with as well, and that's why Jesus rebuked him. You see, the cross was predestined by God to come before the crown, and it wasn't to be the other way around. And though things would not transpire the way they thought they would have, because there were only three selected to uh, witness this amazing event, the, the transfiguration, they were, there was jealousy among the nine who weren't a, who weren't a part of a part of it weren't invited to take part. There was jealousy in the hearts of the nine who were left behind, and there was pride in the, in the hearts of those who were. You see, in that time, a person's status was absolutely everything. Honor was given to those who were wealthy, those who held positions of importance, conversations about greatness, and who was the greatest were really commonplace among the Jews of that day, and and after they responded in silence to Jesus' inquiry, the text is that he sat down and called his disciples together and began to teach them, which is something that Jewish rabbis often did during that time, and he mimicked that. And as he had done on other occasions, Jesus teaches a countercultural and paradoxical lesson about true greatness. And he said, if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. In other words, greatness in the kingdom of God is not determined by status, but by service. And this was not the message that they wanted to hear. This was not what they thought would be the case when they left everything behind and they followed Jesus. This was not something that they expected to hear, especially after all the miracles that Jesus performed. This was not something they expected to hear after seeing him miraculously feed 5,000 on one occasion and 4,000 on another, and, and, or after seeing them de defy the laws of physics and walk on water. This was not something they expected to hear, especially after seeing this amazing event of Jesus transfigured in all glory on the mountainside a few moments ago ago, their desire for recognition and status and honor was something that they had to lay aside to become really a nobody, which is what servants were considered to be at that time, nobodies. As Jesus' words hit their ears, their hearts must have sunk somewhat in the same way that the rich young rulers did when Jesus told them, you know, you want to be perfect, you want to come follow me, then go sell all that you have. And then come follow me. To be the greatest in the kingdom, something they truly wanted, was something was to become the greatest servant. And you know what? That was a counter-cultural message, if there ever was one. R.T. France says the preeminent status in the kingdom of God is characterized by the twin elements of loneliness and service. This was something that Jesus modeled repeatedly, loneliness and service, loneliness and service. He was God, yet he came into the world in the loneliest of circumstances. He was God, and yet he ministered to those in need. He was God, and yet he was a friend of sinners. He was God, and yet he did not seek to be with the rich but the poor. He was God, and yet he touched the untouchable and loved the unlovable. He was God, and yet he didn't seek after status, after, after positions of prominence and, and, and importance. He sought to be a servant and minister to the hungry, to minister to the hurting, and minister to the broken and the lost. This was a lesson that they needed to learn in order to fulfill the mission of God. This is what they needed to learn in order to fulfill 
<clears throat> excuse me, God's plan and purpose for their lives. This was the lesson that they needed to learn to pick up the mantle of his ministry and continue on with what God called them and predestined them to do. Later in Mark 10, it's funny, you, you, you know, you have this, this teaching, this lesson, but he still didn't get it. Later in Mark 10, next chapter over, the disciples, like I said, are still not getting it. And Jesus has to reiterate this very lesson once again about servanthood and what true greatness is in the kingdom of God. James and John, who uh, the other two who, uh, who experienced the transfiguration alongside Peter, comes up to Jesus and has the audacity to ask him that when he sits upon the throne of heaven, could they have the seats on the right and the left? Could they have the best seats in the house? Could they have the seats of honor? They were seeking after status and honor once again. again. And again, he, he takes a, pr- a moment to pull them aside, every one of them, not just these guys, but all the disciples, and to speak truth once again into their lives. He said in Mark 10, 42 to 45, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of Gentiles, domineer over them. And their people in high position exercise authority over them. But he says, it is not this way among you. Rather, whoever wants to become prominent among you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be first, or you shall be, you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you shall be slave of all. And then Jesus says this, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In these verses and in these few chapters, Jesus gives a a lesson about his Messiahship and true discipleship, and it was all about the same thing, and it is this. Greatness in God's kingdom is not about honor and status. It's about humility and and sacrifice. It's about becoming a servant of God so much so that you are willing to do whatever he he asks of you. To become the greatest, you know what? We got to be willing to become the least. To be first, we must be willing to be last. That that is the path and the position that many don't want to take. And to illustrate this truth, Jesus took a little child that was in the house where they had gathered. And he uses this child as a human object lesson. He said in verse 37, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Thomas Constable says, a child was the least significant person in Jewish and Greco-Roman culture. By using a child as an object lesson, Jesus was saying that service involves caring about people, even insignificant people such as children. It's interesting to note, and I don't have time to get into this, but I just want to note it for you, that in Aramaic, the same word talia is used for child as servant, as well as lamb. There's a whole lot in that I'd like to get into, but I just want to make that a note for you today. D.E. Garland says the point of comparison is the insignificant of the child on the honor scale. The child had no power, no status, and few rights. A child was dependent, vulnerable, entirely subject to the authority of the Father. Yet Jesus chooses such a one to represent those who are needy and lowly. And if one wants to be great, one should shower attention on those who are regarded as insignificant, as Jesus himself has done. And Jesus requires his quote-unquote great disciples to show humble service for the humble. Jesus being fully human yet fully God was the greatest of all time to ever plant feet upon planet earth. And yet he didn't seek after greatness. He didn't seek after positions, status. He didn't seek after greatness, at least what was considered greatness in the culture of his day. No, he paradoxically became the greatest by becoming the least, by becoming the greatest servant of all. He became a humble servant who didn't seek the limelight, but sought to do the will of the Father and was willing to do whatever needed to be done, even if it cost him his life, which we know it did. 
This is the lesson that all disciples of Christ, both then and now, need to learn and live out. The Apostle Paul wrote all about this in Philippians 2, verse 5 down to verse 11. It says this, Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status, no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. And having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredible, humbling process. He he didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death, the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Verse 9 says, Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far above anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long dead, long ago dead and buried, will bow down and worship before this Jesus Christ and call it in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God the Father. Church, if we want to be first, we need to be willing to be last. If we want to become the greatest, we need to be willing to become the least. If we want to be like Christ and follow him, then we need to become the greatest servant of all. As I conclude and our worship team prepares to return, let me say that when I was in high school, I never ever thought, many others did not think that I would be here preaching this message today. I I loved our youth group. And I grew up in Deer Lake and and I, I loved our youth group. It was a wonderful experience and I really wanted to serve on the leadership team. Back then, we used to have elections. People were nominated, and the youth group voted in a president and a secretary and members at large and so on and so forth. And you know what? On two or three occasions, I tried to get on there. They had them every year, tried to get on there. I was probably not the most popular kid. I never, ever got voted in. I don't know. Maybe I only had one vote, and that was myself. (laughs) Never got on the team. Never had a title. Never had a position. But you know, even though I held no official capacity, I wasn't a leader. If I saw chairs that needed to be stacked after youth, I stacked them. If I went around and I seen garbage that needed to be picked up or someone, one of my, my youth pastors said, hey, can you help, give me a hand? Yeah, I'll help you pick up garbage. I'll do whatever needs to be done. I didn't need to be up front. I didn't need to hold positions of importance. I just wanted to do what needed to be done. I didn't know the biblical principle of greatness in the kingdom. I didn't know the principle that if you're faithful over the little that God gives you, we will put you over greater things. And you know, that is the type of pastor I, I, I try to be. I'm not perfect in any way, shape, or form but I will fulfill whatever role that needs to be fulfilled. I will serve wherever there is a need. I will do whatever needs to be done. You might have seen me sometimes. I I remember this was a singing Christmas tree a couple years ago. I was out on the parking lot. We needed one more uh, parking volunteer. Didn't have one, so I went out there. And some people said to me, Pastor, you shouldn't be out here. You should be inside. And I said, you know what? I made more connections in this spot than maybe I would have inside. And you know what? My heart just overflows with joy when I see people serving here at Bethesda with that same attitude. Because I know how greatness is measured in God's eyes. It's by becoming a servant who is willing to do whatever God asks of you. You know what? Before this pandemic hit, and we're tired of talking about it, eh? But, you know, we had almost 500 people actively serving in some area of ministry at Bethesda. Some people served in multiple areas, but we had 500 people serving in our kids' ministry, 
in our youth ministry, young adults ministry, our seniors ministry, first impressions teams, with our supper bowl teams, with our media teams, worship teams, and so many other areas. People serving at our local food banks that we partner with. That is unheard of in a church with an average attendance of 650, 700 on a Sunday. And I've said before that we have the best volunteers on the planet, and I still stand by that. We still do have the best volunteers. Some of them are here today, and I love and appreciate them all. We do it as a church, as a leadership. And we are encouraging. You're watching today, and maybe you have served, or maybe you are, are new to the church, or what have you. We want to encourage you to find a place to serve. The first step is to fill out a, a volunteer application, which you can do at Bethesda.ca slash serve. You can, you can check out their opportunities, current opportunities, find a place to fit. We'll post new opportunities as they come available. Or maybe you have a skill set or a passion or for something else. If so, please let us know. But you know what? As we move forward into this brand new year, into 2022, and as serving opportunities arrive, no matter what area, I want to encourage you, have the heart to desire and desire to become the greatest servant and not seek after being honored but seek after honoring him and honoring God by humbly doing whatever needs to be done that nothing would be beneath you you know it's paradoxical to say that the, that the first becomes last and the last becomes first when you first read it it doesn't make sense yet it makes perfect sense church if greatness in God's kingdom is about becoming the greatest servant. And if it's about doing whatever God is asking, of, asking you to do, let me ask you this question. Then what is God asking you to do? What's been God speaking to you about? And he's calling you to do. What is God nudging your heart about? What is God asking of you? Whatever that is, I want to encourage you to do it. And to do it humbly and with all your heart with all your soul, your mind, and your strength and become great in God's kingdom and in his eyes. For if anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all or she shall be last of all and servant of all. God bless you today.